how we start with uh, the statistical learning theory. Uh, let's consider we have like uh, four different, or actually <laughs> uh, six different uh, algorithms, like multi the multi-layer perception, the support vector machine, the K news neighbors, IV3, C4.5, J48. All those algorithms are supervised learning algorithms. They learn from data samples in which, of course, we have an expected output to be produced, an expected outcome to be produced. For example, let's consider we have like some, some, some problem in which we have blood measurements and we wish to output if a given person has or doesn't have a given disease. So, in that scenario, as we do have some input space with variables provided by, of course, those blood measurements, and an output space provided by the expected, the expected variable, which is, in this case, an output, which is yes or no, he or she does or does not ha have a given disease, this is a supervised problem. Okay, just to define a supervised problem. And all those algorithms are supervised learning algorithms. So let's suppose we build up some model. On top of that, can we prove that model learns even better? Can we prove those algorithms learn? I mean, that's much more general because we are not just worried about a given a given classifier or a given classification or regression function, but in terms of algorithms themselves. So we have, of course, each of those algorithms is going to, under a certain setting, under a certain configuration, properly define a bias, properly define a space of admissible functions. On top of that space of admissible functions, can we prove that algorithm learns. What is learning in that case? This is the main motivation for the statistical learning theory. To start, it was proposed by Vapnik in conjunction with some other, other collaborators, but Vapnik himself was like the main, uh, the main author, of course. He started like around 1965 defining learning. So he came up with a definition for learning, which nowadays we consider the same definition for what is referred to generalization. We're going to talk about that just in a few moments, a few seconds. Okay. And um, we have, of course, to infer some general rule. That is the basics of learning. Those general rules are inferred, are produced from data, from examples, from labeled examples. By labeled examples, I mean we have like those blood measurements and we also have the expected output for those particular subjects, those particular people, for example. And in that, in that particular scenario, we are trying, we have to come up with general rules to classify if a given person has or doesn't have a given disease, okay? Those are the general rules I am talking about at this moment. And this leads, of course, to classification problems. This leads to supervised learning, to the supervised learning scenario. Uh, just to come up like with a very uh, broad sense, let's suppose we have like cars and we have children looking at cars, and how can how can they say that something, an object, is a car, or it's not? Of course, they have to extract features. Those features 
are going to define what we refer as input space. For example, if we consider those blood measurements, let's say those blood measurements are not enough to say if a person has or does not have a given disease. In particular, with talking about cars, for example, colors and doors are really important to define a car, maybe not that important. Not, of course, not that important if we compare with shape and if there is an engine that makes some noise. So those features play a very important role in the, the sense of supervised learning. Those are really essential to come up with models, with learning models. Otherwise, you cannot learn. You cannot learn. We're just going to have like several attributes, several variables, several, several um, um, values that you receive. And at the same time, they have no mapping to the output space to the output values we wish to produce. In that sense, the first steps we have for the statistical learning theory are we have to define what's referred to as input space. We also have to define what is referred to as the output space. Vapnik came up with some necessary assumptions. Actually, some of those assumptions are due to the approach he decided to use to prove learning and not really because of the supervised problems themselves. He also uh, relies on some loss functions, so we need to define the loss function. We also can, can define the risk of a classifier after defining the loss function, of course. I will give like part of those uh, in this module and then we go for the next module giving like more details, okay? So we start with the input space. So in any supervised learning problem, we have the input space. The input space defines the attributes or variables I receive to, um, as you can see here, I receive as input to provide a given output. This output, all those outputs actually, are in some output space, which is also referred as the set of classes or the set of labels when we talk about some classification problem. And of course, when we talk about regression, this turns out to be, for example, real line. But there is no difference. So, in case of classification, this gives me the set of input variables or input attributes, if you prefer to, to name it that, and this, the output space or the set of labels, if it's finite, if it's got like a, a given number of possible labels or classes, or maybe it is infinite, if we talk about regression problems, okay? If we're talking about a regression of a given function. In this scenario, in this particular scenario, I will define everything that comes after this particular uh, class in terms of binary classification. So this output space is going to have minus one as the negative class and plus one as a positive class. And all the course is going to be defined in terms of this binary output space. So learning, in our case, is the same as estimating a function f that is capable of mapping uh, inputs from x, from the space x, into outputs defined in the output space y. So, uh, having f as a classifier, uh, ah, I mean, this is quite important. f is a classifier. This function f is seen here as a classifier. And notice that a classifier is different 
from a classification algorithm. The classification algorithm is the one defining a bias, a subspace of admissible functions from which f is selected from. So I select this f from a given bias defined by a classification algorithm. Okay? For example, let's say I have like a, a bunch of learning examples, a bunch of training examples. So I have the first training example provided the input and its output, several others, and I have the nth example, which includes its input and of course its output, its expected output. And all those lie inside of the Cartesian plane given by x and y, given by inputs and outputs. Of course, when I provide all those to my classification algorithm, it is it must uh, it must select from all those possible functions, all those admissible functions inside its bias the one to be selected as the best as possible classifier f to map inputs into outputs in y okay in this scenario you guys can see we have a probability distribution actually a joint probability distribution we say joint because it maps input space with the output space y so, as you can see here, we have some input space along this axis, represented by x, and here outputs in terms of y. Of course, this is quite a simple example, just to have an idea about what's happening here. Let's say, in terms of x, I have this data distribution, which is a Gaussian distribution in, term of, in terms of x, as you can see here, p of x, the probability of x. In terms of y, I also have another distribution, which is seen here, in red line over here, okay? A red regression on top of the histogram. And this is P of y. Inside, we have the joint probability distribution. What is the joint? Is the, the unification of P of x, which is here, with P of y. And this is the joint probability distribution. If I come up, I mean, when I use any kind of supervised learning algorithm, what I am building up is actually some approximation for this joint probability distribution, which is barely seen in green over here, okay? So every time you guys come up with, oh, I'm going to use like the multi-layer perceptron or supervised learning or supervised or support vector machines, Actually, you are building up some regression on top of this space. A regression? Yeah, a regression. It doesn't matter if I am building up a classification function or a regression function at the end. Both For both um, scenarios, I'm building up some sort of regression for this joint probability distribution. Let's see in details. Let's see like a nice example on top of that. Consider we have like two, uh, we have like a, a single uh, a single guy, okay, and we throw it. And let's say the output for uh, the variable x is going to assume one if we have an even number for that particular die, like 2, 4, or 6 is going to be referred to 1 in x, is 0 otherwise. This means that even numbers produce 1, odd numbers 0, okay, in x. And let's say we have another variable, y, also related to the same die. When I throw, I have y equals 1 if the number is prime, like 2, 3, or 5, and of course, we're going to have zero otherwise, if it's, uh, if it's not prime, it's a composite number, okay? So the joint probability for x and y is given by, this is quite interesting, pay attention, the joint probability is the probability if I have 
a given value for x and, of course, a given value for y. So I have to define both. If I define x equals 0 and y x equals 0, I have just one single possibility, which is the value 1 for our die. Of course, we have six possibilities in a, in a given die, and that turns out to be one sixth. Okay? If I have x equals 0 and y equals 1, I have two possibilities, the value 3 and the value, the value 5, and that happens in 2 over 6 of the cases. x equals 1 and y equals 0 for the numbers 4 and 6, okay? And then I have 2 over 6, and x1 and y1 I have only for the number 2, and that's, that's 1 6. Of course, if I plot it, I have a given behavior. Let's see. So, what if I want to say what is the most probable output for y if my x is equal to 0? Is it going, going to be like y equals 0 or y equals 1? That's the answer I expect for a supervised learning problem. So, if I give some x, what is the most probable y, okay? So, I'm going to illustrate it using a problem. This is the problem we've seen, we've just seen. So, if I have like x equals 0 and y equals 0, I have 1 over 6 of the cases in this scenario over here, okay? Uh, ah, yeah, I suppose 1 over 6, right? Yeah, 1 over 6, it's, it's over here, okay. And then I have for x0 and y1, I have 2 over 6. And x1 and y0, I have 2 over 6. And x1 and y1, I have 1 over 6. Let's confirm it, because I just, I just did it. Okay, so 0, 0, 1, 6, 1, 1, 1, 6, yeah, it's right. And here I have some representation for my probability, my joint probability of x and y, as you guys can see here. As you may notice, for any, for uh, even better, every problem, every supervised learning problem can be seen like this can be seen as having some input space, some output space, and here I have the joint probability distribution. Of course, I can have like many input variables over here, what turns out to be represented with several axes. But in this scenario, I have just a single axis for input, for inputs, and a single axis for the outputs. But I could have like as many as I, as I want over here, of course. No problem. What is what is devising a given supervised model, model? It is the same as building up some classific, some regression on top of this space. Let's say I have like, like a given regression that perfectly matches this rectangle, this other, this other one over here, and this volume over here. So, if I have a perfect matching for all those guys or those blocks, I have the best as possible function. I have the best as possible classification function. That's, that's all. So, if you come up, let's say I come up with a model that passes all over those blocks over here, like this, just on top of those blocks, and they are very far from those blocks. What is the error? The theoretical error is the difference I have from this surface that passes all along over on top to this block, to this block, to this block, and from here to this block. So all those distances turn out to be my error. This is quite interesting, isn't it? So supervised learning is a matter of inferring or a regression on top of the joint probability distribution. That's all. Of course, in order to build up some good classification or regression function, I need to have many, many data 
uh, instances to devise this joint probability distribution. So I can come up with a nice regression on top of those blocks. Otherwise, I can't. Of course, in this problem, in this throwing die problem, it turns out to be quite easy. I don't have like many possibilities. I only have those. I don't have others. So I don't hear, I don't need like any infinite uh, data sample. But if I go for a real world problem, I really need as many data instances as, poss as possible to devise some joint probability distribution. And of course, com coming up with some regression on top of that. Okay. Another point that you guys must observe is if my x is zero, what is the most probable output is one for one. If my x is one, the most probable is zero for y, as you can see. The most probable. Is it like completely sure? No, it's not. Because if I select x equals zero, I have some probability of having y equals zero too. Okay? But the greatest is y equals one. So here you can see that supervised learning does not mean that I will have the only answer every time, the only single and best answer every time. Like, oh, it's going to be one and I'm going to hit it. Like in 100% of the scenarios. No, that's not true. Because for one one six and two six of the scenarios, I have like actually if I divide considering x equals zero, I have like one third of, of the scenarios I will make mistakes and two thirds I will hit. So I have like a nice result for two thirds and not for the the last third. Let's let's say the same happens if my x is equals one. Okay, so it does not mean that my result is always perfect. It means that my result is the most probable result. Okay, so what does, does it mean, this joint probability? Now, I, I, I believe you guys can, can have like a big picture. In statistics, it means the relationship between two random variables, x and y. And of course, we are considering that x helps to produce some result of y. I mean, x has some sort of information connected to y, because if both variables have no dependence between each other, we don't have any way of, of relating x to y. It's going to be like a completely independent guessing. For example, x is going to be Gaussian and y is going to be Gaussian. Yeah, we can, we can have like a, uh, even worse, uh, uh, a uniform distribution here, a uniform distribution here. So we're going to have like in this space, just a single block with random probabilities and X can assume any value of Y and vice versa. That's not good, okay? It's going to be like the worst as possible result we could have. So what I mean with that is, our variables, our input variables have to be meaningful in terms of producing the classification we wish to get, okay, or the regression we wish to get. In machine learning, this is the same as saying that the relationship between the input space X and the output space or labels Y is provided by the joint probability distribution P. So from that Vapnik, it, he made like some, some assumptions to ensure learning. The first of those assumptions is examples are sampled in an independent manner. So samples, samples, not, in, not one given sample, but once, uh, not a given sample, we'll have like some input in space y, x, which has some relationship with output in space y, a given sample, one, one single, single sample, okay. But if I select several samples from here, they are not 
they are not dependent in terms of this space x. We can see that. We can see that later, no problem. So examples are independent from each other. That's quite simple to understand. Let's suppose we draw like some balls from a basket. So if we draw with replacement and we selected at first the ball equals two or three or one, the probability is going to be one third of selecting each ball. It doesn't matter if it's, I, 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 I draw like uh, 1000 times, probabilities are going to be the same. But if I draw without replacement, the probabilities are going to change. At first, 1, 2, and 3 had the probability equals 1 third. But after, after drawing the first ball, the probability of, of drawing 1 again is going to be 0. And the probability of drawing 2 or 3 is going to be 1 over 2. So the probability changes. If the probability changes, this is quite related. Just to give like a big picture at this moment, I'm going to go back. This is quite related to changes in this joint probability distribution. If this space changes, how could I produce some nice regression on top of those blocks if they move, for example? It would be impossible. So that's related to this, okay? Just to give like a, a basic idea at this point. Just to, to give you like some, <clears throat> some additional information. For example, if I consider like some training set or some problem uh, in which I want to learn, I wish to learn handwritten characters. Is it safe for example, to learn or to say if a character is A or B or C or D or E, if I have like 1,000 people writing all those characters, like A, B, C or D or F and G, whatever, are those characters written by 1,000 people independent from each other? They are not completely independent from each other because if myself decide to write A and B, there is of course some sort of dependence in between my A and my B because that dependence comes from the way I write, comes from my cursive uh, writing. So of course there is some sort of dependence. But if, if instead of a single person, I have 1,000 people writing those characters, could I relax the principle and say that my characters are somehow independent from each other? Yes, I could. I could because by having many, many people writing, cursively writing those characters, of course, there is like some dependence, but it's not that relevant, okay? But what happens if I'm trying to learn some classification function or regression function in the scenario of drug discovery, in which, of course, it, it is way expensive to extract features from all chemical compounds we have in nature. Of course, people are not going to extract features from all, all those compounds. We have like some specialist giving uh, a very strong bias, saying like, no, instead of selecting compounds from uh, features from 1,000 compounds, we're going to select features from two compounds, only two. How can you say that our um, sample, our data sample is completely independent? It's not, because some specialist decided which are the important compounds to be analyzed. So there is a very strong bias towards the selection of compounds. Just to bring a practical examples. Um, I, know, I don't know if you guys know MNIST, M-N-I-S-T. It is a benchmark, a data set benchmark used to classify, um, classify um, numbers from 0 to 9, okay? And those numbers were cursively written as well. 
written by, uh, if I'm not wrong, by 7,000 people. Of course, we have 10 numbers. We have from zero algorithms, from zero to nine. So, of course, if we have like 10 numbers, just to give you some idea, let's go back here. We have like 10 numbers from zero to nine, okay? But we have 7,000 people graphing or writing from zero to nine. So we have 70,000 images of those algorithms written by humans. In that particular scenario, I suppose you guys can notice there is some probability of selecting one particular element, let's say this zero, which is one over 70,000, and there is a particular probability of selecting another number graphed or written by the same person. As we have like a replacement, we also have the probability of 1 over 70,000. So this multiplication gives the probability of dependence of having two images selected uh, from the same data set with 70,000 images written by the same person. Of course, if we decide to write, like, uh, if we decide to select, like, many images, let's say 10 images, all 10 at once, we ensure that we selected all 10 at once, and we are sure I gave you all those 10, this is the probability. So that probability is going to be quite small. I can relax the principle and say that there is some fair independence on my setting, on my data sample. So that is the case when I have uh, some when ha when I have data sample produced by people, for example. I need to have some sort of independence. But on the contrary, let's say that are two two people only graphed those numbers. So I have 10 out of 20. I have I'd have like a very high dependence in between those images because I have less people and of course just you in this case graphing writing those algorithms. Okay. Going back um, another point, ah, I, I, I just discussed about the direct discovery and this scenario, but it's, yeah, it's written here again, no problem. There are some areas that impose relaxations to this principle, as I mentioned now. So, for example, it's impossible to consider the data set referred to as NIST as a completely independent data set because it's got some dependence if I, if I ensure that I've got all those, for example, 10 images selected at once. But of course, that could be relaxed. I could say, no, it's not that, that high. The probability is not so high, it's not so, so large. So I could say they are independent. Those images are independent from each other, okay? We can test for dependency. For example, let's say I have some examples produced according to a normal distribution. Now I go back to my R, okay? I will produce some examples. Let's say my average, my mean is going to be zero, my standard deviation one, and I will produce like 1,000 observations in my sequence X. Okay, it's in here. If I plot X, I will have some sort of Gaussian behavior along my X axis. My X axis is here. Okay. If I plot a histogram, I will see this Gaussian behavior. It's going to be easier to see the Gaussian behavior. Of course, this is built upon the values of X. 
all those values, okay? Now, I can assess if there is a given level of dependence or not. I can use an autocorrelation function, autocorrelation function to measure the dependence. This autocorrelation function is going to do exactly this. I have like a bunch of examples, 1000, so it's going to get, for example, from the first to the uh, second to last, multiplied by the second to the last. So we're going to have, oh, it's not just a multiplication, actually, it's a, a linear product, a dot product. The greater this value is, the greater is the dependence. And of course, I'm going to change this window and normalize this number. So I go from 1 to 999 uh, dot product to from 2 to 1000 and then from 1 to 998 then from 3 to 1000 for example I'm just giving like some, some bare examples here and from 997 to 4 for example and then from 996 to 5 just giving like some some examples here all of those products are going to be normalized by standard deviations. Actually, this function ACF computes that, computes that for me. When it computes, you can see the plot over here. All those guys here are legs, are time legs, or simply legs we can refer to. What is a leg? It gets x, for example. It multiplies the, the, sorry, the dot product by itself. This is going to be my representation for a, a correlation equals to one. So I normalize in terms of in terms of deaths, all those dot products that that are going to happen now. Now I take x from one to nine nine nine, multiply uh, sorry dot product by x from two to 1000 and that's going to be my second value over here which is for a leg equals one a leg equals one means i'm reducing one here and increasing one here before computing the dot product this means i'm trying to verify if this data pattern is similar to this data pattern, okay? If they have like they share some similarity. Of course, when I divide this by something that I normalize and call as one, as correlation equals one, this turns out to be very, very small, as you guys can see here. Okay? 0 0.02. It's quite small. Okay. To compute this, which is lag equals lag equals two, I will do of course, this from one to nine nine eight to three and divide by again this. And the number is going to be quite small again, quite small again over here. Okay, even smaller than this one, and so on. And here we have some confidence interval of 95%. That means that if we don't have anything going outside this interval, it means basically that a given data uh, vector has no correlation with another vector of the same attribute under legs, under time legs in this case, or under legs simply. Now let's consider why, given by a sinusoidal function, which is going to be like 2 times pi times the sequence from 0 to 9 length equals 1000 and then I will have like some y. This is my sinusoidal function. It's got some dependence. This has a dependent behavior. It's not difficult to notice because every time I have like some dependent behavior, I repeat some, path, some data patterns. So the repetition, the recurrence of data patterns means means um, correlation, means depends. When I assess the correlation of y, the autocorrelation function, I notice 
a very high correlation, which surpasses, of course, the confidence level of 95%. So I can notice in this case, sorry, going back, I noticed that for some deterministic time series, for time series that depends on past values, what is the case of a sinusoidal function? The autocorrelation function shows dependence, shows dependence along that attribute I'm assessing. And this is quite interesting. Data samples have to be independent from each other, otherwise I cannot ensure learning according to the statistical learning theory, guys. It's just impossible. We're going to see why this is the case. We're going to discuss that in detail. Don't worry, guys. But that's quite, quite important. Without assuming independence, independence is just impossible to prove learning. If we have dependence, we have to come up with ways of um, adapting our data space to make it independent, otherwise learning cannot be ensured. There are some ways, uh, some like, let's say, naive ways of analyzing dependence. If I randomize data, a data sample and, for example, I select part of my data sample to build up some training model and test on the other randomized test data sample and my error turns out to be similar in my test and my training sample, I can say that, of course, naively say that uh, my data sample is independent, okay? But if I randomize and my result turns out to be completely different, oh, that's a problem. Going back to my R example with my plot Y over here, let's go back to my plot. What happens if I randomize it? If I do something like this and randomize my Y, take a look, completely different. Of course, if I measure my autocorrelation function on top of the randomized Y, take a look, it, bro it has just broken all the dependencies. So when we randomize examples, we break dependencies. If they don't have dependencies, the behavior is going to be the same. But if they do have dependencies, when we come up with the randomization, we break dependencies. And learning is going to be affected, of course. Something that we had for our training sets is not, is not going to have the, a good behavior for our test set. Okay? This, this is quite important. No assumption is made about the joint probability distribution P. This basically means that we are agnostic in relation to the joint probability distribution P. This basically means that the statistical learning theory does not assume a given distribution. For example, a family of distributions. For example, only Gaussians can work or only Weibull's can work. Uh, only Poisson could work. That's not true. We can work with any kind of data distribution. That's a very good assumption, actually. That's a very general, that makes uh, the statistical learning theory general enough to deal with any kind of data distribution, any kind of joint probability distribution. Labels can assume non-deterministic values due to noise and class overlapping. I'm just going to go, I'm going to go back for, for a while. I'm going to, yeah, to this example. This has class overlapping. What is class overlapping? When I select a given x, let's say x equals 0, I don't have a simple answer like y is always going to be 1. No, there is a probability of, a, of y being 0. If I select x equals 1, what is the probability of having y equals 0? It's greater than having, having y equals 1, but 
y equals 1 is possible, so there is some sort of class overlapping. This means I don't have like a, a, a unique answer. I have some probability of misclassification when x is 1 and when x is 0. This is the same as saying, let's go back, that labels can assume non-deterministic values. That is due to class overlapping. That class overlapping might happen, might happen because people may label data incorrectly, may label examples incorrectly, such as like spam. And people, let's say some, we have like lots of emails and people detected like labels spams as uh, an email as a spam, and it wasn't any spam. It was like a, a good email. But it could, it could be misclassified by a specialist. And that is the case of non-deterministic values being um, given for uh, some, some example, some, some given email in this case. Okay? Of course, we expect that only for a small portion of our messages, of our instances, of our examples. Otherwise, we're not going to learn anything out of that. It's going to be just like a completely fail. Okay. In a second class, sorry, in a second case, we can have like overlapping classes due to a different, a different uh, aspect. Oh, this is interesting. Let's let's go back just to, to make this clear. We can say that misclassification like not on, on purpose in purpose uh, not on purpose it's just like a noise like noise and label okay but it's going to bring some non-deterministic values as I mentioned and we also have the possibility of overlapping when you say for example we're going to classify people according to height we're going to classify classify and say uh, which is the sex, okay? That's not, that's not really possible because we have lots of overlappings if we consider, uh, if we consider Saxons. It's like that there is a, a very a, a, a mix of people having the same heights but being from different sexes, of course that brings non-deterministic values, such as a problem about uh, throwing the die, as I, uh, we discussed before, okay? Much more important than having non-deterministic values in our problem is, is it possible to produce y equals 1 or y equals minus 1 by having x equals a lowercase x? I mean, the question is, besides having perturbations in our space, besides having noise, besides having non-deterministic values due to class overlapping, if we have, the, uh, if the probability of um, having positive one or negative one as output is greater than, for example, 50%, we are learning something out of that data sample. And that's quite interesting. So besides the perturbations, besides the non-deterministic values, we can actually learn something from data, even in the presence of those influences, those bad influences, of course. Uh, we prefer like no noise and no class overlapping, of course. That is like perfect scenario, but the real world is not like that. We've got like some perturbations that happens. Sorry. Another important assumption: distribution P, the joint distribution P must be static. This is quite quite simple, way simple to understand. I'm going to go back here just to show again this joint probability distribution. If it changes, if those blocks move around as I receive more data, how can I learn it? How can I uh, come up with a nice regression on top of those blocks? It's just impossible. So the data distribution, the joint 
probability distribution has to be static. Otherwise, it's not going to work. It makes complete sense. Okay. And of course, this brings some questions when people talk about concept drift in data stream scenario or learning in the scenario of time series. All of those scenarios will uh, consider, sorry, consider uh, that data distributions change over time. So if they change over time, I need like some other theoretical guarantees to come up with proofs for learning, okay? So I, re I require like some additional stuff on top of the statistical learning theory. Oh, so the stati uh, statistical learning theory is completely useless in that scenario? No. On the contrary, it is very, very useful. However, you need like an additional set of uh, a different framework, a different theoretical framework to ensure that, okay? Ah, uh, last one. Distribution P, the joint distribution, is a known at training time. That's great, actually. This makes our uh, the statistical learning theory framework even more general because it can work on top of any any data distribution. So it doesn't matter the distribution we have. We don't need any prior information. Any uh beforehand information beforehand we only need to assess data actually indirect uh I, here it's more like assess access to of course because you need to have access to the data distribution and assess data in order to estimate the best as possible uh, regression on top of that joint probability distribution, distribution, as I mentioned before. So we can come up with any kind of data distribution, and it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not necessary any prior knowledge on the data distribution. So we receive data, and on top of that, we try to come up with the best as possible regression for that particular joint distribution that we are noticing as data arrives, as data arrives, okay? So, as seen before, the objective of supervised learning is to learn this functional. We wish to learn some classification or regression function that maps input space into output space. Input space into output space. We refer to this function f as classifier or regression function. It's, it's missing here. Or regression function. In order to estimate f, we need a measure to quantify how good this function f is, how good it is. And this is related to the loss function, okay? And the loss function is a very important concept for the statistical linear theory. It assesses, it evaluates if my classification function is good or not. That's something I'm going to discuss on the next module. See you guys.